This is the story of TAM Airlines Flight 3054. On the 17th of July 2007, a TAM Airlines A320 was flying from Port Alegre to Sao Paulo's Congonhas Airport in Brazil. The plane departed Port Alegre at 5.19 p.m. local time. As the plane flew towards Congonhas, the weather was very bad, a sign of things to come. The A320 that they were flying was limited in a way. The plane did not have an operational thrust reverser on the number 2 engine or the right-hand side. Thrust reversers are used to redirect air in the opposite direction of travel so as to help with braking. As they got closer to the airport, they got reports from other pilots who had landed on runway 35 left. The runway was wet and slippery. They'd have to be extra careful on this approach as they had an inactive reverser. The plane flew the approach perfectly. As the plane flared over the runway, the pilots brought the throttle back. The plane touched down at 140 knots, but they soon realized that something wasn't right. The plane wasn't slowing down as they had expected and the spoilers had not deployed. Making matters work, the auto brake system had not engaged as well. The nose gear touched down and the plane showed no signs of slowing down. The plane ate through the limited amount of runway that Congonias had. Six seconds after touchdown, the pilots realized that they had to do something and they engaged the brakes with the pedals. They were also fighting the plane. The plane wanted to veer to the left, but the pilots fought it with rudder inputs. But it was too little, too late. Runway 35 left was just too short for the plane to stop. The plane veered to the left and exited the airport premises. The airport was raised by a bit, so the momentum of the plane carried it over a major road near the airport. The plane impacted a building nearby. No one on board made it, and 12 people on the ground did not make it. Finding out what happened to Flight 3054 would be hard. Congonhas was one of Brazil's busiest airports. If something was wrong, they needed to know. Talking to pilots, they found something strange. They were apprehensive about landing at Congonhas, concerned in a way. The airport was surrounded by buildings and it was densely populated. Flying in and out of Congonhas, especially under rainy conditions, was very challenging for pilots. Why was this? In 2005, they found that the runways had a low friction coefficient. That is, the runways were not putting up enough resistance to slow landing planes down. In addition to that, water pooled on the runway, making landings very slippery. So they set out to retexture the entire runway and they decided to remove rubber from the runway at increased intervals. All of this was done to increase the friction coefficient of the runways. But the waterlogging problem had not been solved and so hydroplaning reports kept coming in when the runway was wet. At the beginning of 2007, the runways underwent some more modifications to fix the gradient and to work out some surface irregularities. As part of this overhaul, they decided to put grooves into the runway. The idea was that the grooves would channel the water away and prevent water from pooling on the runways. This would solve the hydroplaning problem that they had been facing. But the groovings would take time, and so the airport management decided to put the runways into service without the groovings, for the time being anyway. Quote, In the end, the operational conditions of Congonhas Airport brought the pilots a feeling of unease, according to what was learned from the interviews. The reason for the discomfort was precisely the lack of options in case of emergencies. According to the interviewees, the airport offered little or no margin for errors or failures. End quote. Delving into the flight data recorder, they saw something that they did not expect to see. As the plane approached the runway, both engines were at a relatively high power setting. Right before landing, the left-hand engine, or engine number one, was put into idle, and once the plane touched down, that engine was put into reverse. But according to the flight data recorder, the right-hand engine, or engine number two, was at climb power throughout the landing sequence. So, when the plane landed, the left-hand engine was doing all that it could to slow the plane down and the right-hand engine was trying to maintain a previously selected speed. Both engines were trying to do the exact opposite. This also explained why the spoilers did not engage. The spoilers needed both throttles to be in reverse, or one throttle in the reverse setting and the other one at idle. They're designed so as to not engage when one of the throttles is at a high power setting, 
Without the spoilers, the plane would need an additional 50% of runway to stop. Space at Congonius was already at a premium. The lack of spoilers caused another problem. The auto brakes needed the spoilers to deploy, and without the spoilers, the auto brakes never kicked in. Once the plane was on the ground, something called thrust lock kicked in. Thrust lock, as the name suggests, locks in the thrust of the engines, meaning that they're frozen at that power setting till someone in the cockpit changes it by manipulating the throttles. So the left engine was locked in this reverse setting and the right engine was locked in this forward setting. Since no one moved the throttles, that's where they stayed. So now the question becomes, why was the right hand engine at such a high power setting? The investigators had two hypotheses. The first one was that there was some sort of communication failure that told the right hand engine that climb power had been commanded by the pilots when they had not. Now, they had to check if the correct signals were sent to the engines. When the throttles are moved, the signal goes through a chain. The signal goes from the throttle to the artificial fuel unit, to the thrust control unit, to the FADEC or the Full Authority Digital Electronics Control, and the FADEC sends the data to the FDR. The FADEC, the TCU, they all checked out, and none of these had failed. And if they had, there would have been ECAM messages and caution lights, and the FDR recorded none of those. They looked at the throttles and the artificial fuel unit. Airbus estimated the probability of a failure here would be 4 times 10 to the negative 8th power. That is very unlikely. Much of the throttle assembly and its linkages had melted in the fire. Unfortunately, they weren't able to figure out the position of the throttles at impact. And as per the manufacturer, the failure of the AFU was very, very unlikely. They carried out simulator tests where they recreated the flight from the flight data recorder and every time it was the same outcome, the plane going off the runway to the left unless they opted to go around. This leads us to the second hypothesis. Someone made a mistake. First. It should be noted that the pilots were familiar with the airplane. They had, in fact, landed the plane that day at Port Alegre with the deactivated thrust reverser without issue, and the plane itself had landed at Congonius multiple times. The plane at the time of landing weighed 63.5 tons, which was under the 64.5 ton limit for the airport. Moreover, as per the calculations done, the plane would need about 1300 meters or 4200 feet of runway to stop without using the reversers. The runway at Congonius was almost 1900 meters or 6200 feet long, so they had a significant safety margin. As they listened to the CVR, they heard concern in the voice of the pilot in command when he learned that the runway was wet and slippery because that would make landing that much harder. But how do you land with a deactivated thrust reverser? Well, like any other landing, you touch down and then engage the reversers on both engines. But this always wasn't the case. There is another procedure. In this older procedure, you brought both throttles to idle and then only engaged the reverser that was working. The other engine stayed at idle. But this was phased out as pilots made errors while carrying this out. But the older, more complex way of doing things had one advantage. It needed less runway. You see, in the newer method, you pull both throttles into reverse and so the engines would spool up so that they could deflect more air forward. The computer then had to stop the engine with the deactivated thrust reverser from powering up too much. This took a split second, so there was a small boost of power from the deactivated engine during the landing. This meant that the airplane needed more runway to stop. 55 meters or 180 feet of additional runway was required. So, it is plausible that the captain opted to use the older, more complex method of thrust reverser activation as he was concerned about the runway. He had this mindset of, we're going to need all the runway that we can get. The captain was stressed and he had a headache, so there is a possibility that he made an error during this procedure where pilots are known to make errors. This could also explain why it took them so long to recognize the severity of the situation. At first, when they touched down, they probably assumed that the plane was hydroplaning and that's why they did not seem too concerned. 
when flight 3054 landed, the captain had inadvertently left the right-hand engine in the climb detent. In a perfect world, the automation would warn you that one of your engines was in reverse and the other one was generating thrust. Airbus knew this and so they developed the H2F3 standard. This standard would warn pilots about this very error. But this modification was put out as a service bulletin, which meant that it wasn't mandatory for the operator. The operator would have to choose for it to be installed on their plane. Flight 3054 did not have the system installed. The pilots had a 7 second window to bring the right hand engine down to idle after they had touched down. Had they done that, they would have been able to stop the plane on the runway. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.